All right. Well, I'm Kayla. I am presenting this workshop entitled Branding Your Business. Um, from confusing to compelling, hopefully you'll learn a few things. I run a graphic design studio here in Peoria, Illinois, and uh, you'll learn a little bit more about me in a minute. But hopefully I did not anticipate this to be on Zoom and in person, so hopefully I'll cover all of the bases and this won't be too confusing like we're not trying to do with our branding. So. Um, I'm going to do some quick polls here um, and show some slides. And I want to know, so this first slide uh, is, let's say I was going to search for a YouTube video on music theory. I'm searching for a music theory video to watch. Which video would you choose, top, middle, or bottom? And anybody in the room? This is just open polling. Middle. Do you want to open and raise hands and stuff? Sure, okay. let's go top. Who would pick the top one? Top one, anyone? Middle? Interesting. Yes. Yeah. Uh, what about the last one? This is totally opposite than my previous <laughs> polling. So no one picked the first two. They actually have fewer views. And most people picked the bottom one. Mm. And I think my guess would be because it looks professional. It's a little shorter than the middle one. Um, it doesn't have a guy with a weird face making <laughs> weird faces, although maybe that's what makes you want to watch it. I don't know. So that's interesting. Um, so then I have uh, the next one. And I'm going to show you two different slides. And um, let's say you were going to search for a plumber, okay? You're going to search for a plumber. And here's plumber number one. So I'm going to show that to you. Take it in a moment. Look for what you need to find on there. Okay, there's plumber number one. And here's plumber number two. So I wish I could show you these side by side, but they're just not as great that way. Um, here's number one, again. And here's number two. So show of hands, who's gonna pick one? Okay. And who's gonna pick two? All right, I'm curious, why would you pick number one? I don't know, it's like, it's nice and tight, like everything, I can see everything in there. It's very well organized. I, huh. I mean, there is a lot of content in there. I know that might be a, a turnoff, but maybe for some people. The other one, if you go to the other one, it feels like it's really <clears throat> zoomed in and I can't quite see, and maybe it's just the way that this is displaying. Yeah, it's probably see. part of that, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, if someone who picked number two, why would you pick number two? I went with number two because it was it looked cleaner, less busy. There was less it, it was less overwhelming. I guess that was mm -hmm. kind of my perspective. You kind mm -hmm. of touched on that a little bit, but that was that was the draw for me. It looks like it's easy to navigate. Totally. Um, I'm learning here because I would never have picked number one. I picked an extreme and extreme example because. To me, the logo looks kind of pixelated, so that means maybe they're a little unprofessional. It looks like they do a lot of different things, so maybe they wouldn't do plumbing as well. Uh, the call to action is just sort of lumped in there with everything else, whereas the call to action on this one, um, you'll see at the top uh, right, you'll also find email easily and then in the header, um, Again, there's a button with a call to action. So I know I couldn't show the whole website, um, but that's why I would pick number two. Um, additionally, I guess both of them have a consistency in colors, but I thought, I don't think this is a great website. I don't think it's great branding, but I did like how they made some connections with the yellow, the call to action buttons, um, the number that you see in the top left. Um, so I'm learning too, and this is really fun. Okay, so the next one I'm gonna show you is two different Instagram pages. Um, I, I love going to Grand Rapids, and so 
Um, I just chose two coffee shops. Let's say you're going to Grand Rapids. Which one would you be more likely to choose? The one on the left or the one on the right? Now, you can't really see these super great. And in fact, they look a little distorted when you look on the screen. Um, but would you pick the one on the left or the one on the right? Right. Why would you pick the right one? Um, I would choose it because of the colors and the photos look more um, organized, I guess. Or, mm -hmm. you know, there's more of a focus in a lot of the photos rather than like, a bunch of stuff going on. Exactly. Like it looks a little more clean, maybe. Like for me, uh, it looks like more professional. It looks like they're showing more like branding. So like mm -hmm. they want to show like, oh, we have those cool things, but we have other cool things because the first one shows the like, yeah, locations, but not the products. You know? Right. Because it's like, like we want to, because the coffee shop is like aesthetic, so come there for like the atmosphere. You know? so Absolutely. Our vibe, vibe so right. We also have online comments. Mm -hmm. Corey says on the right, it's cleaner looking. Carly said left, it's more at home. Hmm. Cool. I'm learning something as well. I also I picked number one, the one on the left. Uh -huh. So my learning is uh, don't ask me about brain. Or go opposite. I felt like I sort of picked an extreme example for the left because um remind me how to say your name again, Darina. Um you don't really know what they're selling when you look at it right away, other than seeing Grand Rapids coffee and one little uh, coffee maker and then a bag of coffee. There's not really a lot about coffee on their feed. This is really terrible because I've been to Madcap Coffee before uh, in October. <laughs> <laughs> really not good. Not good. And <laughs> I've been to Madcap Coffee and I feel like their Instagram gives you the essence of what it's like yeah. to go and be there. Yeah. And so part of branding is connecting your shop with your social media with your website um, and all those different pieces together so this was just a fun little exercise um, so thanks for humoring me last question yeah so basically if you get a branding right you're going to get more customers even though your product sucks potentially <laughs> <laughs> you might get more people in the door it might be what gets them to your website to your social media in your doors um and that's a big step all right um so my question is do we judge books by their covers do we look at things and make judgments about them um so oftentimes we'll look at a youtube channel or we'll look at an instagram feed and we'll make a judgment or decide whether or not we want to go there based on how confusing it might be, how clear their messaging is, how obvious it is what they sell. I don't know if you're like me, but you've gone to a website and you're like, I really don't know what they do. I don't know what they sell. Or you've come across um, someone's social media and you think, I don't actually know how to buy their product. Um, and so it's so important because people are judging um, your business by uh, your cover that we dive into this. So that's why we're gonna talk about how to turn our branding uh, from confusing into compelling. Um, hi there, I'm Kayla. I wanted to share a little bit about myself. I got my start um, in the nonprofit sector in 2008 when I graduated college. Um, I worked in brand marketing and development and then I started my own studio in 2014. I work alongside a lot of businesses in a lot of different industries, but I have a special place in my heart for the baby and kid industry like Dakotot, Briar Baby, Tajari and Co. Um, and those are all uh, national, international brands. Um, so it's been a fun journey. And then at the end of last year, I hired a studio manager who's taking care of a lot of my admin work. So if we ever work together, you might hear from her too. So let's take care of first things first. 
Um, what do we mean when we say brand? What's what pops into your head? Cattle branding. Cattle branding. <laughs> Sorry, I watch a lot of Yellowstone. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like a concept or something? It's like, I don't know, because brand is like, it could be like, I don't know, a shoe brand. Or like, so, I don't know, it's like for me, like thinking like Gucci or like, I don't know, Chanel, they all have their own like concept, like message label. Message, message yeah, exactly. It's bigger than the product. Bigger than the product. Yeah, That's something. Image. Something differentiating you from the product. Mm hmm, exactly. Do we have anybody? Way of life. Um, is there anybody on chat that I need to be paying attention to? Okay. Their thoughts are okay. Well, brand is such a big word. All of those things are true. Um, there's probably more than we can say than I have on this little pie chart. Um, value, mission, messaging, offers. Um, and today we're just going to talk about one little slice of the pie, which is visuals, because each one of these things could take up a whole workshop, if not more. And not only that, I specialize in the visual side of it and um, am thinking we'll just head that route today. Um, so I know what you're thinking. You're probably like, okay, why are we having all these distinctions and definitions? We just want to get to how to make my brand compelling. Well, we'll get there. Um, but what do you think of when you think of visual identity? Color scheme. Color scheme. Continuity. Continuity. I like cohesiveness. That's a word I use with clients a lot. Logo. Logo. Font. Font. Consistency. Consistency, consistency with the colors and the fonts and the imagery. I like. I have something in my mind. The only for example is this picture. How the photographer took an angle, but like what else? Like exactly he wanted to show on the picture. I don't know how to explain that, but like it's like a, you know, like you can take this part of the thing, right? To take it right. Picture, but you could, you could not take it in the picture. So it's like kind of what you want. Right, like maybe the, the ethos of a brand composition. composition. Those are good too. I also thought of in my quick brainstorm, someone said logo. Oftentimes, uh, nowadays especially, there is uh, thinking that a brand needs a logo system. And the thought between that is or the thought behind that is that nowadays you're not only using your logo on your packaging but you're putting it on a very tiny 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 social media square you're blowing it up on billboards you're putting it on a vinyl wrap around a truck and so your logo has to be very versatile and so sometimes one logo isn't going to do the job and so you're going to have to break it down into smaller marks, maybe a variation on a sign. Maybe it's just going to be the type. Um, so sub marks. Oftentimes, I don't know if any of you have been to a website. I'm on websites quite frequently. I don't do websites, but um, oftentimes I get to visit clients' websites and there will be, there will be icon markers or something that says, uh, call and there's a picture of a phone, text, and there's a little message bubble, email, and then there's an email icon. But a lot of times the really good brands have those icons or imagery or illustrations that match what their logo and what their overall brand is. Um, someone said fonts, color usage, your website is a part of your brand. You have no idea how many times I've gone to someone's website and it doesn't look like their logo looks. It's totally different. Um, your social media, if you do marketing emails, um, your product photography, or if you do any sort of action shots with your photography, your imagery, your packaging, your print collateral, your business cards, your brochures, your intake forms, um, car wraps, the list goes on. Whatever is visual, whatever your eyes can see about your brand, that's part of your visual branding. Um, 
Does anybody have any other thoughts? Um, Robert said mood and energy. Thank you. Mood and energy. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and that can oftentimes be uh, evoked, I guess, through colors, through um, the way your logo is constructed or imagery is um, taken care of by a photographer. So brand is, so when I say that, I want you to know that brand is so huge and visual branding is just a slice of that. And even that, we're probably just gonna scratch the surface. And I would love to talk to each of you about your individual branding struggles. So um, let's talk later, because I know I will not probably um, get to all of it. So when you think about your visual branding, these two things come to mind. And one that's to stay humble and to remember your ideal client. And I say this because I don't know if you've ever watched, um, now I'm blanking on the name, but this guy goes in, he invests in business, and he says, in order for you to succeed, you need to change X, Y, Z about your business. And so often he goes in and people are like, yeah, you're right, but I'm not gonna do that. And I've had that experience too with clients um, where they're so tied emotionally to their logo, even though it's not connecting with who they wanna sell to, um, that they, they just don't wanna give that up. And so I want this to be a reminder for myself um, and to all of you too, to be open to what, um, to be humble that you might not know everything about your ideal client or you might um, need to give up what you love in order to meet their needs and solve their problems. Um, Eric said it might be the profit. Does that sound right? Yes, oh. it's the profit. Yes. Uh, thank you, Eric, um, who was like, why am I having this brain freeze? The profit, yes, he knows what I'm talking about. Um, and so two, remember your ideal client. I think Marcy talked about ideal client last week and I didn't want to beat a dead horse, but it sounds like many of you haven't been here. Um, so Marcy can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think she said, if you're selling to everyone, you sell to no one. Um, and that's so true. You really need to know your ideal client who, Think, imagine, just sit and imagine, who's the person that you believe will buy your product? Who is the person that you'll, you're solving a problem for? Um, because these are the things you have to ask yourself before you get, you go anywhere with branding. Um, for example, what you sell to a child right now, is gonna have a totally different logo than what you might sell to your aging parents. Um, it's going to have a different aesthetic. It's gonna have a different feel, a different vibe. Um, it's gonna look different. Um, and so we have to remember that when we're trying to brand or give our brand a visual identity. Um, any questions so far? All right. You want your customers to imagine how much better their life will be with your product or service. So these are foundations that I set out to think about when I'm helping someone create their, their visual branding. So what's the first thing you should do? If I were you, if you came to me and you had a brand already, and I told you to stay humble, think about your ideal client, um, to invite them in to a story. The next thing I would, I would recommend for you um, is to do a brand audit. So we just talked about all the pieces that go to a visual identity. So what I would do is I would schedule a time, maybe an hour, maybe two hours, depending on how much visual collateral you have um, and pull up your social media, pull up your website, pull up any marketing emails that you have put out in the world. Um, if you 
do products and you have product photography, get out your files with the product uh, photography. Um, if you have brochures and business cards and intake forms, maybe you have course materials, maybe you have catalogs, I would pull all those things together and just sit with them and say, do these go together? Are they cohesive? Are they targeting who I believe my ideal client to be? And if your answer is yes, then like, way to go. Um, I know that for myself, there's always more to do. Yes. If you have a tangible product uh -huh. or like uniforms and a service industry or things like that, do yeah. all those get wrapped up? Oh yeah. Anything. If you, I should mention this too. If you're a restaurant or a coffee shop, just sit in your space. I don't know if you, any of you have had this happen where you see one of those Instagram profiles online and you go to the shop and you're like, wow, this is not like this coffee shop showed on Instagram. Either this is way nicer or this is not as nice. Um, and so just sit in the space, sit with all of the visuals that you have and think about your ideal client. Um, think about whether or not this is cohesive. Um, and like I said, if, if all of it's perfect, then like way to go. I guarantee you, I know there's always people that are coming to me that are like, oh, we're going to tweak this about our packaging because it's just not quite fitting who we're targeting anymore, or we've made some updates to our brand. So we're going to add this, this pattern to it, or um, we're going with a different system of packaging, or we're totally revamping a menu. So we are, no one's arrived. Um, but your, if your answer is, I don't know, invite someone into that. So have a friend look at it, have a family member look at it, someone who you trust as a designer or just someone, we all have friends probably that are just really on point aesthetically who know what's going on. Um, and so invite them into it. Um, people like myself, other agencies are always happy to have a consultation with you and sort of outline what steps you might want to take to get to the next level. Um, and if your answer is no, it's, it's a little bit of the same. Bring people around you who can kind of guide you to those next steps um, and decide what your long-term and short-term goals are because it's going to vary for every business. Um, if you're really, if you're really product driven, you need to really think about product imagery and invest there. There's sometimes it depends on the business, but their product photography actually needs to ramp up and it really, they could just have the basic, the most basic logo, the basic, um, brand assets in that way, but whatever they're selling is driven visually through photography. Um, some people do need, um, whether it's car truck wraps or um, business cards or brochures, they really do need to have a more strategic uh, logo or, or graphic design system that can come around them. Um, I've read multiple places that uh, seven to 10% up to 25%, some sources say, of your gross revenue should be spent on brand and marketing. I don't know if that's true, but that gives you kind of a rough estimate. If you're bringing in $10,000 a year, you probably should be spending at least a thousand, which seems like a lot if you're only making 10,000. And if you're making a million, that's a lot of money to devote to brand and marketing. Um, so think about, where you will make the biggest impact. Um, so I wanted to show a couple of things that I, I think are really good brand um, examples. Um, a couple of things that I worked on, hopefully I can get out of this and show it all to you. Um, let's see here. Um, Okay. Now you're seeing my email. Um, and how many I haven't answered. Yeah, you said you were busy. <laughs> right, exactly. So 
I worked for a company called Briar Baby, and um, they started out as a one-woman show um, sewing these baby bonnets together. Sorry, one second. Slide is not showing. Huh. You have to... Um, you have to stop sharing and then reshare. Stop sharing. And then reshare. And then reshare. Okay. All right. Okay. We we good now? Yeah. All right. Okay. So I worked for this company called Briar Baby. They started as a one woman show. Um, Sewing these baby bonnets became huge through influencers on Instagram. They have a really good um, marketing strategy. And so I've designed these emails using, um, they have a copywriter, which is uh, wonderful uh, to work with. But I think their aesthetic is really compelling. I mean, this is if you have a baby and you wanna buy a bonnet, but they have beautiful imagery. Their typography is excellent. Um, they have little icons you can see, um, that match their branding. Um, and I'll pop over to their Instagram. I feel like the, the two are married. They go together, um, really, really well. Um, let's see, I was going to show a couple of others. I don't know if any of you have been to a Wally's. It's on I-55. Is it on 39 or 55 up to Chicago? 55. I think their branding is better than any other gas station. I mean, it's more than a gas station. But um, Corey also agrees. Corey said she loves <laughs> Yeah. Like, you go in there and everything is branded. You can't really tell from their website as well, but the colors... They have this really great tagline, home of the great American road trip. Um, you know, if you want to search for a Wally's, they have a map there for you. Um, I just think the colors go together. You just have to go into Wally's to know. I wish I would have pulled up a picture of Wally's. But um, the second one is, um, I think one industry that can really, really struggle is uh, floral companies or floral shops. Um, this is a website that I thought was really good. This goes into other sorts of branding and even selling, but you go to it, it's called Porter Flowers in Texas or Porter Flower Reserve in Texas, right here. It says, download your free guide to sending the perfect flowers every time. It's like, okay, I'm here. I want to know that. So I'm going to put in my email and they've just got your email so they can sell to you. Um, and they have this beautiful logo. It's really clear, um, their call to action. All of their fonts go together. Their um, colors match. Um, they're, they're neutral, but yet uh, probably the people going to this website or uh, the people sending them there, th these colors, these fonts speak to them. Um, it tells us what they do. Um, again, the imagery is really consistent. The fonts are really consistent. The colors are consistent. And um, that's really what you want uh, for, your, for your website or anything you're putting out, making sure your imagery, your logos, your colors, your fonts are all consistent. Um, this is another floral shop I came across. This looks really high end. Um, so you they are probably selling to high-end people. Um, and so that's something else to be aware of too, your ideal client. What kind of money are they spending? Are they spending a lot of money? It looks like these are pricey. Um, and so they have created an elevated experience on their website, which you can tell. So to generate more revenue, you don't wanna look like you sell everything on the cheap, right? Um, so you want your visuals to reflect that, um, as well. Are there any questions as we go through? No. Okay. Yeah. Um, I guess it's kind of for my own personal situation. Sure. But, um, 
What about brand new music venues where, or venues that have different kinds of shows because your your customer is always changing? Mm -hmm. So like, obviously the collateral for one show may be different than others, but what's like the baseline there? That's a hard question. I would, as far as logo, I would probably go with something neutral yet modern. I mean, you're going to get all sorts of people in. And so the people who don't care about branding <laughs> probably aren't going to care about what your logo is, but the people who do are going to want something probably closer to, closer to their taste. Another thing that I would consider is coming up with color palettes that would be, um, you know, maybe you've determined that you are, um, there's four types of music genres that you really target. Um, and so creating something that would weave certain colors together, but like, let's say your classical is black and maybe a, a deep red, but then that deep red goes with like a brown and, uh, I don't know, I'm just coming off with stuff off the top of my head, but like an evergreen, and that would be more of your country music color palettes that you use when you're promoting stuff. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but having a few neutrals and then sort of deciding, okay, these are the types of, of individuals we're speaking to and making sure those colors, that we do have some consistency woven through, but then have, um, really clear and i don't know if it's just you or eventually you'll have a lot of people under you creating but having really clear guidelines i think having brand guidelines um that's something everyone should have um is really important so a lot of times these come um i deliver them in a pdf format um multiple pages depending on how big the brand is how do you use your logo what color of logo goes on what color of background? What are your color codes? What are uh, the fonts you're using? How to use them um, with a heading and then a subheading and then the body copy um, and outline things really, really clearly. So, you know, it's interesting that you talk about brand guidelines mm -hmm. um, because the average small business, when you talk about brand guidelines, mm -hmm. um, one or two things will probably happen. The first thing is, I'd be asking in my mind, can I afford you? Mm -hmm. Number two is, can I do it? Mm -hmm. Right? Can I follow, actually follow the instructions mm -hmm. that you're creating a brand on? Well, I think that's something you sort of have to decide. Um, you know, are you gonna stay small? And I, there's always a tension there, right? So am I gonna just get a free logo on Canva, um, which is perfect for starting out, but you have to recognize like, you don't really own that logo. 10 other people, a hundred other people might have that logo. Um, do So maybe I do wanna hire a designer to get those brand guidelines, get something unique, but then you're worried like, are they expensive? Can I follow these guidelines? But I think that's always, we always have to kind of do the next thing before we're ready in business. Um, and so, you know, I'm not a business guru by any means, but talking to people like yourself who could say, okay, I think you really need to have a solid brand that's not a Canva logo or a stock image. Um, you need to take that next step. And in that next step, do you want to prepare, you know, for the future where you see, see your business going, or you just want to focus on right now? And if it's just right now, then maybe you can get by with, you know, if you're the only one touching your logo and you're the one having control, it might end up more consistent than if you have, you know, a marketing team and several graphic designers and a web designer and an app developer. That's a whole nother story we didn't, you know, talk about if you have an app. Um, that's, those are a lot of hands on that. So those are great questions, Faith. So uh, Brian shared that he agrees that you should be branding the location, and then work around 
there. I think Andrew and I have a similar challenge with Distillery Labs. Like we've mm -hmm. got a brand, mm -hmm. a logo, and all that good stuff. But how do we keep? How do we continue to promote different things like this um, while balancing keeping that brand consistent? Right. Which maybe we can talk about this later. But I, I think it was hard to know whose workshop connected with whose, or even that it was connected to Distillery Labs because there wasn't really brand consistency there. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Um, but before we keep going with questions, um, I'm just gonna wrap up here. Um, this is really confusing. Um, it's not actually, but sorry for the slowness. Um, Yeah, let's remember this, that all brand development is an investment. So it's not an expense. If it was an expense, this would be really depressing. But anytime you can invest in um, your business and taking it to the next level and giving it opportunity to grow and to produce, um, to attract your ideal client, to stand out in a crowded market, to get people in your door on through your doors or on your website, um, eventually you're gonna generate more revenue. And so um, always look at any any sort of brand development as truly um, an investment. Um, so I think that's all I have. Um, I can take questions and then, um, we can go from there. Any questions online or questions in the room? Yeah. Can you talk about auditing your, your business? Uh huh. How often do you do that? Make sure that you're it probably depends on the business, but I think for me, always the first of the year or the end of a year is a good time when you're thinking about okay, what are my next my my revenue goals or other types of data that you're tracking, how is that gonna play into that? And so for me, I start over sort of January 1st. So usually at the end of the year, that's a really good time to look at it. But if that's a busy season for you, and maybe you have a dead season, um, like June or something like that, you know, think about the ebb and flow of your, the work you're doing in your business. Um, some people, are tighter on their some like think about nike think about mcdonald's think about some of these really big brands that are really caterpillar they're really um just careful about what they're putting out there they have people looking at everything all the time so it sort of depends on your business what you're trying to accomplish um but once a year i would say minimum. Marcy Goodwin had a question. Uh, do you have an audit checklist or a cheat sheet? I do uh, from another workshop, but I don't have one with me. Um, <laughs> well, can so, you email you to get one? Sure. Or maybe what I'll do is put it up on my blog or website mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. um, for people to grab. I know it needs, that also needs a brand refresh. So that's why I didn't put it out here. But can you talk um, about? A little bit more about the evolution of brands because you're talking about the brand refresh uh -huh. but your brand also evolves as your company your business and the person behind it right and just our world like think about how covid's totally changed businesses and how they're operating and um some have found themselves more online um more now than ever and um everything has changed because of COVID. So I totally agree. And that's something that I didn't really get to flesh out in my um, thoughts for today, but brands truly are dynamic. They're always changing uh, depending on who, you know, there could be a lot of solopreneurs here. I don't know where everyone's at, or you might have a small marketing department who's all making decisions and, and giving input to those things. So, um, you're exactly right. 
brands are always evolving, always changing. You, when you think about your ideal client, is your ideal client someone who follows trends? Um, are, is your brand trendier? Then you're going to have to be a little more up on the times as far as bringing in certain colors or certain kind of imagery. Um, and if your brand is pretty traditional, you know, you don't have to think about that quite as often. So just to clarify, when you say client, you mean customers? Yeah, I'm using those kind of synonymously. Client, okay. customer. So, um, then, so then should we be designing our brand for our customers or should we be designing the brand so that we become the trend that customers want to come to? That's a very good question. There's probably different mm -hmm. schools of thought on that. Um, so I think, I think it's both and. So sometimes you create a product or you create a service and it touches, um, it really touches who you are as a person and the type of person that you are is the ideal client. Um, I have, um, or ideal customer. So I know someone who created a certain product that she and her mom friends wanted to see in the world. And so she truly is her ideal customer. So she knows her ideal customer like really intimately in a way that let's say you're a you know, 40, 50 year old adult and you've created something for kids, you're gonna have to do a lot more research on what's going to make kids ask their parents for them to buy something. Um, or, you know, I think there's a big aesthetic gap between generations, even from boomer to Gen X to millennial to Gen Z. And so even you're just going to have to do research or what I like to do with my clients is, um, if they come to me, we really hash this out. Like, who's your ideal client? What do they like when they see something? What speaks to them? Did you have something? Yeah, great uh, question here from Barbara. She said she's in just starting a business and feel like I can hardly move forward without a well-defined brand. Mm -hmm. Can you tell her what to expect and what to bring to a brand manager or designer and what kind of cross relationships does she need? Photographer, social mm -hmm. media manager, et cetera. Those are all really, really good questions. And um, I'm gonna put my email up here. Um, I guess I didn't get to this next slide. Um, maybe we'll go back. Um, but if you want to ask me follow up questions, Barbara, directly, I'd be happy to do that. Um, so when a customer client comes to me, um, and they're like, I need help with my, my branding. Um, one of the first things I'll ask them is what is your goal for this? Cause if your goal is, um, you know, just to have it look pretty or just to sort of get something out there real quick. Um, there might be something bigger we need to look at. So like your ideal client, um, looking at your product specifically, who, who is the target, who is going to buy it. Um, and so we take a deep dive into all those sorts of things. I have a questionnaire. It's not too intensive because I don't want to bog people down. Um, and then we'll have a one hour meeting or so um, after we agree to work together uh, to really flesh out some of those things about um, who you're really targeting and the kind of aesthetic that they're drawn to. Um, and so some questions that uh, I would ask, um, let's say you're, you're talking about a brand designer, a logo designer. Um, one, ask them, what are they gonna give you? So are they just gonna give you a JPEG of a logo or are they gonna give you a whole brand package? So I try to make it as clear as possible and I know I don't even, I need to be more clear. You always have to tell people more than uh, you think you do. When someone agrees to work with me, we, we do a whole, 
brand package. So it's logo, it's sub marks, it's any icons that you would need. Um, I think you mentioned you were in the food or drink space. I can't remember, Barbara, but um, you know, if you wanted something branded specifically um, to be like the gluten-free uh, icon or the nut-free icon that really went with your brand, we could do that too. Or um, sometimes we'll do patterns, so backgrounds for uh, web or social media, um, packaging, um, depending on on what you're really selling. Um, I would ask if you're getting a copyright or if that copyright is, um, if the graphic designer is maintaining the copyright. If I do a logo project, it's a lot easier for me to hand over that copyright because that enables you, you know, if I'm gone in a year, then, and you feel like the colors we use isn't quite matching up to who your ideal client is, then you can, you can, you have the liberty to change that. Um, I also would make sure that you're asking for a vector um, file of the main logo or any, really any of the assets, making sure um, with the exception of maybe a background and maybe any, um, you know, stock images that someone would give you but really everything else needs to be um, in vector format. And then along with this, just asking, um, usually a graphic designer will say, do you want me to use commercial free fonts or do you wanna go a little bit more unique and I can price out some different um, fonts, which sounds crazy because we think all fonts should be free, but really if you're gonna choose a unique typeface, um, that could cost a little bit of money. So I would ask, um, and usually a good graphic designer or a good um, brand designer, any, an agency, they'll have you sign a contract and all of that should be in there. You should know exactly what you're getting. But I would just be clear with whoever it might be that you know exactly what you're getting. And those are the questions I would ask. Um, and then as far as that goes, you know, um, it's been interesting through COVID, and I think just in recent history, a lot of times people in some of your positions would just think, oh, I need to go to an agency, which agencies are great. Um, but now more than ever, you can get good talent by kind of picking and choosing, like saying, I love this graphic designer's aesthetic. She's going to build my brand. I love this photographer. He's going to do my photos. Um, I like this web developer. Um, and so you can kind of do everything a la carte. Um, but I think the top three is just making sure you have a web, um, depending on how you're selling. Uh, I think it goes without question. Everybody needs a website uh, now. Um, but having a web designer, a graphic designer, um, a photographer, I think having someone who can write your brand positioning or do any sort of your messaging and copy. Copy is a really great asset to have in your pocket. You had mentioned vector logos mm -hmm. um, and that versus a JPEG. What's the significance of having a vector over a JPEG? That's a good question. So, um, so if you, uh, let me think about, so JPEGs are pixel and um, as opposed to vector and there's a lot of mathematical technicalities that go into that, but you cannot blow up a JPEG infinitely without losing resolution. So if you ever go to a website, um, and I see this even happen on Instagram where everything looks pixelated and granular and it's not for aesthetics, you know, cause there's ways that that could be cool. Um, but it looks like they just missed the mark. Um, it's because it was pixel. It was too, it's too small. Um, and so when you blow it up, it's just gonna look pixelated and grant. It's that kind of grainy, blurry, unprofessional look. But when you have a vector logo, you can blow it up infinitely. So you can put it on billboards, um, giant signage without losing any resolution, meaning there won't be any jagged edges um, or blurs or... Yeah, 
exactly. Not everybody can see that. Oh, maybe they can. Mm -hmm. um, but that looks vectored. Andrew and I talk a lot with uh, <clears throat> entrepreneurs, people that have started their own businesses, and they say, I wish I would have known fill in the blank sooner. I wish I would have done something or known something sooner so I didn't get this far down the path and then have to go back and re you know, correct some things. At what point should someone really start paying attention to brand? Because it's probably not when they think of their idea, first time their idea for a business, but at what point, what would you say would be the ideal time to start talking to people like yourself? Hmm. I don't know that I'm like the best person to gauge that. I think probably looking at cost data, all the analysis would be a better, someone who's doing that for you would be a better um, person to talk to. But I would say either you have some sort of capital, like you're starting out and you have some sort of capital and you feel like your whatever your product or services can't really sell till there's a good package around it, there's a good book cover around it. Um, like it won't leave the shelves unless you have that, you know, making sure, you know, as you're getting investors that you save, you know, $5,000 for branding. Um, and, you know, you might be able to get decent work done cheaper. Um, but I would say until you're ready to make that sort of move or you're making money and you're like, okay, I need to, I need to bump this up from DIY to, I know I have a good product now. I know I have a good service now. Now we just need to like take this to the next level. So you made, you made a good point about costs. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what does, in your experience, where do you see in terms of what it would cost to get something, you know, good quality ballpark figures, I guess? That is so hard to say. Uh -huh. So like when, okay, like let's say you're coming to me, I'm going to ask you, okay, are you planning to put, like, if I was doing, let me think of a scenario, but if you're planning to continually generate revenue off of this logo, then it's going to be more pricey than um, my friend who's like, can you do a monogram for my resume? And, you know, maybe 25 people are going to see it. Does that make sense? Like how many eyes are going to be on your logo? So what I charge for national international brand is much cheaper or much more expensive, sorry, uh, than I would charge for someone local who's maybe going to have, you know. And the amount of hours that you're going to be investing into that. Too. Right, right. Although sometimes it, I'm spending the same amount of hours for a small business as I would, you know, for a larger company. So you talked about something sense. really interesting, which uh -huh. is a monogram for somebody's resume. Uh-huh. Um, so we really haven't talked about personal brand. Right. Which is also really interesting because a lot of small businesses, their uh, personal brand becomes their business brand. Mm-hmm. Can you share more about that? Is there anything specific? Uh, like, I guess it's like at what point, you know, like... Do you take your personal brand to be a brand? Yeah, and also perhaps the idea that should the personal brand be the business brand? I think that's a question I ask myself every day. Because, I mean, the name of my business is Kayla Phillips Design because I started out as a sole proprietor and that was just easier and the domain was free and I went with it. Um, but now I'm like, all of a sudden, my brand and my name is tied to the things that I create as opposed to, you yes, know. Yeah. What? You're stuck with it. I'm stuck yeah. with it. Now I'm like, okay, this now, is. Now, then I don't mean that joking, but it's not. Right. Bad. You right. Have a brand. Right. People are buying you. Right. And and that's the difference between you know, I am my brand, so to speak, and it's true because they're not coming. While I have my studio manager, Katie, she's doing some of the admin work, so I can actually spend that one-on-one -on -one time with clients. So I think the same is true 
for a personal brand are what they doing is it one-on-one -on -one consulting and if that's so like whoever their customers are are buying them so to speak you know um so i think i would keep it that way until it starts growing like let's say i decide which i don't want to do this i want to run small and lean but let's say you know in a couple of years i decide i'm going to hire a web developer i'm going to hire a copywriter i'm going to hire a photographer and i'm going to open uh philip's design agency you know then it sort of distances me and my name from it and people it's implied that they're not just working with me they're working with i don't know if i answered your question yeah yeah i think yeah uh kayla i'm not sure 100 implies but certain brands they tie in the strategy, mm -hmm. right? Meaning, I think something that gets missed by a lot of brands is they don't make brand promises, mm -hmm. right? An example of, of like Southwest Airlines, brand promises, low fares, lots of flights, no baggage, mm -hmm. right? They then follow it up with what, in my role, we call it the KPI is kept promise indicators, mm -hmm. right? that you can then look in on the web page of Southwest Airlines, lots of flights, okay? Look from Midway to Detroit, Midway to Minneapolis. They're running all kinds, mm -hmm. right? Throughout the day, mm -hmm. lots of flights. Low fares, that can be subjective, but they really pride themselves on low fares, right? So if you look at that in then versus Delta, they're usually less, mm -hmm. right? So it backs up, the brand promises are tied to a kept promise indicator mm -hmm. and then no change fees, you know? Mm -hmm. Do you get into that one? I, I do, I, I teach that a lot, but it does tie into strategy, but I call it a brand promise mm -hmm. and then followed by the kept promise indicator. Yeah, so we're probably working, if we were to take that pie chart that I showed, mm -hmm. we're probably all overlapping just a little bit. So I think it was Barbara who asked, what should I ask? Uh, a graphic designer or brand um, strategist or uh, brand designer, that would be part of my question. So I do get into a little bit of strategy. I'm not there to write messaging and positioning. Right. If that's what somebody needs, and then I will send them to a colleague. But everything that we create is really strategic and how we think about the ideal customer. Um, I've worked with customers who have had brand positioning done before they got to me and said, I have this PDF now of all my messaging. How do I make this visual? And so really taking that and thinking about psychology of color and font usage. And so it all ties together um, and is wrapped together well. I hope that answered yeah. um, that question. I'm just fascinated by all of it. I think it's... <laughs> You know, again, not to give a strategy, but there's there's so many things that get missed. You know, what I mean, because right. brand is so much bigger. It's so big. It is. It is. And, and to, to simplify it mm -hmm. and speak to your ideal client, it mm -hmm. makes it so much easier. When you know what Marcy would probably say, when I'm making posts, mm -hmm. right, my brand, but I'm also speaking to my tribe, if you will, right, my ideal client, right, so I attract more of them, right. You know, so it all ties into the people. Right, and so I think the more we can cut down the confusion and stick to brand colors, brand fonts, uh, consistent imagery, um, consistent logo usage. That really takes it from that confusing, what is this, who is this, to, oh, I'm interested now. Like what you said at the beginning about how you're kind of like your brand grows with your business. So in terms of dollars, it starts out rather small. Mm -hmm but that percentage of spend can luckily stay the same. Um, but getting started with it probably seems to be money well spent. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't get into that, oops, I wish I would have done stuff earlier. Like you said, you're kind of stuck with your name or your, maybe some of your uh, identity. It's harder to change your identity um, as an organization. But it's not impossible. We've no. seen so many brands who, I mean, oh, yeah. you get Facebook online and there's all the hubbub about they changed their name to this and they redid their logo and 
Google shifted over the G like one <laughs> pixel, <laughs> you know? Like people are always gonna talk about it, but maybe that's a, a way that all publicity is good publicity, I don't know. Yeah. Um, just to build on uh, Aaron's question, you know, have you seen in your experience, people start with a very, uh, I guess, for lack of a better term, uh, you know, minimal brand design, and then over time begin to, you know, as the company and business grows, expand and extend the brand, what mm -hmm. is that like? Right. So several companies I worked with, they started very minimal. They got a basic brand design done. So they got their basic logo done. They got colors. They got um, typographer fonts. Um, they got their brand guidelines. So they're good to go there. But then as they went, they decided. Um, so I brought up the uh, Briar Baby, the baby bonnet company. So as I've been working with them, you know, there have been times where they're like, okay, we want an illustration of X, Y, Z, you know, a bonnet or a shopping bag or um, all of their little icons are a hand-drawn flavor. And so that's going to change with the season. So, you know, depending who you are, what you're selling, um, I have a client now that just got done with the Christmas season and now... It's Valentine's Day. So some of their branding was we did some red and green traditional holiday colors. And now we're switching over to still keeping their brand, their their basic logo, but tying in um, uh, Valentine's Day because that's advantageous to what they do and what they sell. Follow up question. How much lead time should uh, somebody give? Uh, you or other brand designers to make something happen, to make magic happen. To make magic happen. I think it probably depends on the designer. So personally, I've, um, as I've tracked my data and all the various um, things, it's helpful for me to only be working on two brand designs at a time. Um, and those are all six weeks. We try to get them done in six to eight week stints because that you kind of lose momentum um, and it's harder to plan the further out you get. So, and I would say most, um, if you're getting, if you're getting a really well-crafted unique logo done, not something stock that someone's whipping up, but something that is unique and tailored to you, that's strategic, um, it's going to take six to eight weeks to complete um, just so there's time for you to have the feed to give feedback i i have a little feedback form that i give um my clients every time i complete a revision so i can know exactly what is not uh hitting the mark for them um, and it makes the next round a little bit easier um and i think it probably just depends on it on every graphic designer I would say is different, but I would say for me personally, I'm only working um, on two at a time. So I'm almost done with two, I have one starting and then I'll have an opening. So it just sort of depends. Um, and, and again, like sometimes I'll get on the phone with a client or a, or a potential client and I'll start talking to them and I'll realize like they don't really need a full brand. I mean, depending on what it is, they might not need this, you know, three, four, five, seven thousand dollar brand package wherever they're landing in that mix. They might just need something very basic, a basic icon to get them started. Um, and and then they can, like you were talking about, then it can grow from there. Um, and so trying to determine what do what does someone actually need? Um, I was just wondering. Uh, so, do a quick time check. There's been awesome questions and discussion and conversation. Mm -hmm. I know Brian was going to say a few words, but any final questions, thoughts, ideas people have um, as we switch over to Brad and have him tell us about what's coming up, coming up next week with his lives. Sure. <laughs> Business cards are still useful. 
because I feel like we're moving towards like the website. And I feel like my generation, even when the older people give us business cards, we don't really ever use them. So do you think it's like still useful? Because my mom is asking me to design one. Uh -huh. She wants to start like she is a therapist, you know? So I don't know if it's still useful or not. So it might actually be helpful for her because she's a therapist. Like she could use them to write appointment cards. Um, I kind of questioned that myself. I didn't bring any business cards. So I want to say you you have it like on the screen. right. Um, and so I ran out. I literally ran out of my last business cards before the last networking event before things shut down, and I'm not re created them or reprinted them because I think I have the same question as you but I think sometimes because we live in such a digital age especially older generations really love to hand on hold on to something tangible personally I end up throwing them away but I was at a coffee shop the other day and I saw a couple of business cards laid out and I was like maybe I should get business cards and just have my QR code on it and people could snap that real quick um, and leave the card there but it's at least something they could see. So it's just the design would be so much different than it would be like five or ten years ago. So for example, right. a website that you're on right mm -hmm. And you also want to think about the brand, right? Like say for example if you're Gucci or your uh, Hermes or some luxury brand, the texture of the card can be different, the feel, the, mm -hmm. and you know, let's say- um, It might be part of your brand. Like for me, I think about it because I do design a lot of print collateral. So if someone saw like how beautiful a piece of print material you could hold, they'd be like, huh, maybe I'll hire her because 